I'm glad you could make it for the first live chat in our six part series about the Science and Technology Policy Fellowships Program of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. My name is Kat Song. I'm the Communications Director for the s and Policy Fellowships, or STPF. I will be your moderator for today's chat. The 2020 live chat series is an opportunity for you to ask current and alumni fellows your questions. You'll also hear what's happening at the Science Policy Interface in the federal government today. You'll learn about some of the office placements for fellows, and we hope you'll see how the fellowship can transform your career. Today, I'm joined by three fellows, Dr. Regina Pope Ford, Dr. Brian Gray, and Dr. Ambika Bum. But before we dive into conversation, I have a few housekeeping points. Full information about the SDPF Fellowship, as well as info on eligibility requirements and the application process can be found on our website at AAAS.org slash STPF. The web address will also be on the last slide. Today, we're happy to kick off the live chat series with this session, How Can SDPF Enhance Your Career? We're hosting one chat each month during the application season. Please join us for any or all of them. Each chat will focus on a different aspect of the fellowship experience and will feature different fellows as panelists. In case you haven't heard, the application opens on Monday, June 1st, and closes on Sunday, November 1st. To learn more about you, the audience, I'll be asking a few questions. Just respond to the questions as they appear on the screen and click to enter your response. So the first question is, do you plan to apply? Okay, you should see the results there. There are a lot of you, thanks for being here. For those applying or thinking about applying this year, congratulations on getting a jump start, jump start on your application. For those of you who may be a few years away from applying, it's great that you're here. It's not too soon to start. There are lots of ways to learn about and engage in science policy now. And for those of you who aren't sure, we're glad to have you here to chat with our fellows. AAAS, Science and Technology Policy Fellowships, are an opportunity for doctoral level scientists and engineers to spend a year contributing their expertise to federal policy. This year, positions are available in all three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. In addition this year, we're offering the Roger Revell Fellowship in Global Stewardship. Fellowships are a one-year full-time commitment in Washington, D.C. Applicants in 2020 are applying for a position in the fellowship class that runs from, from September 1st, 2021 to August 31st, 2022. Of course, no one knows what the world will look like next year, let alone next month. A lot will continue to change between now and then. SDPF is vigilant about keeping fellows and their families safe. The incoming class who is set to arrive this fall is strong with no decline in number. For future applicants, all eligibility requirements and deadlines remain in place and can be found on our website. We will keep applicants who then become candidates and ultimately fellowship finalists up to date throughout the months long application and interview process. And last, fellows come from a wide range of disciplines. Please click the discipline that best describes you. Great, thank you. Beautiful. Like the fellows, you are all representing many backgrounds. STPF fellows have diverse expertise from biological and physical scientists or sciences to social and computer sciences and engineering. This is important. 
the federal agencies and offices that host fellows are looking for a wide range of backgrounds and skills. Eligibility. Applicants must be US citizens, hold a doctoral degree in science or engineering, and cannot be a full-time federal employee at the time of applying. Those of you with a master's in engineering plus three years of professional engineering experience are also eligible to apply. We're looking for strong scientists with solid expertise in their field for their, careers, their career stage, as well as the following. Leadership potential, that's maturity, good judgment and initiative, communication and outreach skills, especially to non-scientific audiences, problem solving abilities, and commitment to the fellowship objectives of flexibility, professional growth, and public service. Now for the last question of the day, do you know someone who has been an STPF fellow? Okay, a lot of you. Um, so if you didn't know any before, you'll leave this webinar uh, knowing three. And if you already knew a fellow, you're growing your network today. Fun fact, we have more than 3,400 alumni around the world. The purpose of this live chat is for you to chat with fellows. So please ask questions. To do that, click the question box in your menu and type your question in. And if you like, you can indicate the person or people to whom your question is directed. But we'll get to as many questions as we can today. Now, finally, I'm happy to introduce you to our fellows. Dr. Regina Pope Ford is a current fellow in the executive branch. She is placed in the National Science Foundation's Division of Engineering Education and Centers. Dr. Brian Gray, is a Congressional Fellow sponsored by the American Institute of Physics. Brian is placed in the Office of Representative Jan Schakowsky. Last year, Brian was an STPF Fellow at the National Science Foundation. And Dr. Ambika Bum is a current Executive Branch Fellow placed in the State Department in the Office of Crisis Management and Strategy. Before I go to questions from you all, I'm going to kick, uh, kick it all off with one. Fellows, can you share your thoughts on why scientists and engineers should bring their expertise and training to the federal government? Um, I'll start with perhaps Regina. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> yes, I think it's important to um, for scientists and engineers to bring their expertise to the government because um, there is, it's, it's a different world for one. Uh, I think that there's a lot of ways where you can find that you can contribute. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, we kind of find ourselves, at least as an engineer, I found myself in an area where there's not often um, that contact with people in the government uh, on a weekly or monthly basis at all but it, it enables you now to see where you can be make an impact uh and i think that's very important as, as, as science and engineers and there's also many ways that we, there's problems out there to be solved that um the people who are working in those particular jobs have uh don't have time to solve and as a fellow uh you can have that opportunity to to, to do just that uh Make an impact someplace. Come in and 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 do work on some uh, projects where other people in the daily positions don't have that opportunity to do just that. Brian. Yeah, um, I'll co-sign everything that Dr. Pope Ford just said. Um, you know, just a chance to make an impact. Uh, but I think equally important is. The experience working uh, in the executive, legislative, or uh, judicial branches is a, an opportunity for us to grow ourselves, right? So, um, especially you know, public-facing science, you know, where mo most of us are funded uh, as scientists through the government in some way, shape, or form. Uh, having an understanding of how that works and operates uh, enhances your own skill set. So it's really important. Uh, there's there's a lot of 
learning to be done as well. Ambika? Hi. Um, so ditto on what the other two have said, but to add to it a little bit, um, as scientists, we dive very deeply into really, in the big picture, really small problems or really specific things. Um, and when you're working on the government side of things, you're looking at everything from this massive bird's eye view. Um, and so having that depth of knowledge and helping to bring perspective into that bird's eye view is uh, can benefit all sorts of things, I'm sure all of you can imagine, but it also benefits you as a scientist. Um, I uh, worked very specifically on particular projects when I was an um, academic, whenever I was postdocing and um, PhDing, but then sometimes you're so super focused on what you're looking at that you're not seeing how practically it will translate into society, whether it's into markets or it's into government applications. And um, being able to step back and get that perspective on what works or doesn't, sometimes you're developing a medical solution for something, but you haven't talked to doctors to understand what needs that they have. And similarly, when you're thinking about government um, positions and things, what practically can work in understanding that, um, getting that perspective can benefit you in your career, whether you want to go back into science after doing this um, fellowship or whether you want to continue in government and continue being that link between the two worlds. Thank you. Um, okay, I got, we have a question now. How did the STPF fellowship um, enhance your career or how do you expect it to enhance your career? And you guys can just jump in. I'm just going to order again, Regina. <laughs> well, well, I think it can enhance your career because one, again, you gain an, an insight and a perspective that you didn't have initially. Um, working where I am at the National Science Foundation, it gave me an, an insider's view. Um, I, in academia, or even I had worked in industry in the past myself, but even in academia, you know, a small, well, was a, it wasn't really a small college, but it was a medium-sized school. And in that school, we didn't really have uh, a lot of large grants coming into our, our university. And so it, it oftentimes would give us a, you know, you, you don't really get a good feel for how places like the National Science Foundation really work. And I think the enhancement that I'm receiving now is that now I have some more of an uh, insider's view and a different perspective on how, um, you know, these organizations, these agencies actually function. And I think it gives you an appreciation also for what the people that work there actually do on a daily basis. And, and so therefore I'm hoping that, you know, when I leave that I'll have something um, more that will not only have that better understanding, but also a way that it can, my, my career itself can be enhanced. If not so much me personally, even sharing with others on how things actually work within the National Science Foundation. Yeah, those are excellent points. And actually, I guess I should give a little disclaimer. Like anything I'm about to say is my own personal view um, and not like that of the congressman I work for or AAAS or AIP or anyone else. Um, but before I came to the fellowship, I was actually, I spent several years outside of my PhD doing work uh, at community interfaces. So I was working in community facing roles, um, solving community problems that, you know, were that our community had, had identified and needed to address. Um, so I was doing a bunch of those things. And, you know, a lot of times what we were trying to do was enact policy change, right? What you need is some policy is causing the problem or, or disenfranchising the community or doing something that isn't what, what needs to happen. And we were trying to get that policy changed. And a really good way to, I thought, to help make like, policy change was to go work in policy. Um, so I used the fellowship as really a springboard to kind of get to that point. Um, so I was at the National Science Foundation for a couple of years, um, but personally, I really, really wanted to see what life was like on the legislative side, right? Where does the policy end up getting written? Um, but also, I wanted to, to see what, uh, to work in health, right? I don't have a health background. I really wanted to work in health policy. Um, and I was lucky, you know, fortunate enough to find an opportunity to call Ms. Shikowski, who's incredibly active in that field um, and was willing to work with me um, to, to be a fellow in, in that office. Uh, so for me, it's been a definite, um, enhancer of my career in, in that I was able to get the policy experience I wanted, but also to kind of move into another field uh, and gain some new uh, insight expertise there. 
So to answer that question, I think I have to provide a little bit about where I came from um, so then I can say what I wanted to do with this fellowship. Um, my background is in nanomedicine and right now I'm in the Office of Crisis Management and Strategy and those things don't logically connect necessarily. Um, I did PhD, I did two um, postdocs and ended up launching a biotech company and ran it for five years in the Bay Area related to nanomedicine. And in that, I learned a lot about how do you manage a startup? How do you manage a team as it's growing? How do you develop partnerships? How do you collaborate with different kinds of groups? Um, I eventually, I was then recruited into a role of strategy development for, for the National, the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And I realized that um, one of my strengths is in strategy of thinking from how do you get all these integrated important pieces to work together effectively, but with a goal in mind. And so um, when I was applying for the AAAS fellowship, mostly I was looking at offices that related to my background, but this particular office I found really interesting and unique because it's Department of State crises. So crises are happening all over the world. How are you actually mobilizing people to work on something effectively and quickly? So a startup has that nimbleness to it which it was super fun to do. But when you're working at national lab level or something like that, there's a lot of um, bureaucracy and slowing of processes that happens. And so I was very curious that when there is something crazy happening, how are we coordinating with other governments, coordinating our own people, coordinating between agencies? How are you effectively getting something done in the moment of a crisis? So I looked at it kind of like my version of a government MBA. That's what I wanted to do when I came in with this. I wasn't expecting it to be related to science particularly. I mean, crises have a medical component to it, but I wasn't thinking it was going to be focused on that. Three weeks after I got in, I started seeing reports of COVID and then COVID has become everything that I do now um, because that's been the major health pandemic. Um, and, it, and there have been resources from my past that have been helpful in this office. And so I feel like I'm contributing, but I've also gotten this incredible experience of learning how the National Security Council interacts with Department of State. I'm, the office we're in is in the office of the secretary. So it's pretty high up between in the bi bureaucracy of the Department mm -hmm. of State also. So there's a lot of power in getting things moving there and seeing how that's done, how decisions are made, how conversations happen, what are the protocols in place, what is missing. All of that has been a very eye-opening and uh, experience in the last three months or last four months, basically. Um, Ambika, I just love that quotable quote of the uh, government MBA. <laughs> Next question. Um, what activities do you recommend for applicants in doctoral programs to prepare to be a competitive applicant? Regina? <laughs> We're waiting for you. <laughs> so so the, the question, could you ask the question again? What sure. activities? Um, yeah, what activities would you recommend for someone who's at the who's in a doctoral program now, but who is trying to um, come up with or become a competitive SDPF applicant in the future? Hmm. You know, I don't. I think a person has to really follow their interests, and and I think for every interest that we have as individuals, there's probably a government agency that deals with some of those same interests. So I think what you would really need to do is just follow your your interests. What what are the things that what problems do you want to see solved? What things kind of uh, make you want to go and dig into it further? You know, uh, and I, and I think those that's where you should go. I don't know if there's any other particular things that you have to do as a doctoral student to prepare for the application in the future. I think it's follow your um your line of work follow your 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 passion and something and then you'll when you apply you'll probably when you write your essay and all that sort of thing you'll probably you'll, you'll write all that out and you'll say what you've been doing in the past or what has inter interested you and and that will uh naturally feed into why you want to apply for this fellowship and i'm certain that there'll be some place uh some agency that triple as works in triple as places uh, people the fellows that you'll find out where you can find a home. I 100% agree with that, right? Finding things that you're interested in are is the, the most important part. Um, I think for me, the two things that I thought were most helpful uh, was the experience I had working in community organizing. Um, I 
You know, I spent about four years doing that after my PhD, but even during my doctoral program, I was doing a bunch of work uh, with that with another uh, colleague of mine. Um, you know, and so we had the experience of, you know, taking something from scratch, launching it, you know, developing it, uh, you know, securing funding, you know, doing all of those things. That was really important. Uh, but the other thing I think has been really helpful is, you know, finding as many opportunities as possible to improve our communication skills, whether that's verbal or written. Uh, you know, I, I had written a lot of scientific papers, but I've also written a lot for the general public. I've written about Sriracha, I've written about a bunch of other things. Uh, but learning how to write quickly and concisely into the audience that, um, to, to a specific audience is really important. And I think one of the pieces of advice I got when I came in as an executive branch fellow was that there's nothing you can't boil down to two sentences. Uh, and for us, that was kind of a shocking piece of advice, right? But it turns out to be true. It, it can be really difficult to get to two sentences, but everything that I've seen, uh, you know, people often ask for a short, quick memo that, you know, two or three sentences um, at most, uh, just really quickly move, move, move on, uh, move on an idea. And that's been really helpful. So um, I'm actually curious as to what the uh, interviewers are looking for, particularly. I've, I sit on um, two interview panels for two different scholarships, and both of those, they not AAAS, very different qualities are looked for. But I can, what I can tell you is what I did in my application. And in general, AAAS, when you're applying, you're not applying to a specific job. So you can't necessarily tailor that I want this particular thing only and I own, and like, highlight all the skills that would get you that particular job because first you're getting into the fellowship and then you're interviewing a bunch of places after that. It's not that you have something lined up that you know you're going to. So what do you highlight? Um, I think it's important that you draw out skills of um, like what Brian just said. If you've launched something and you've been able to lead something, be able to draw that out and communicate that effectively in your application. Why were you passionate about it? What is it that you're like striving to do? Um, if you have what I put, what what I did um, in my application is, is I had other AAAS fellows who had graduated. Um, I talked to them a lot, um, and they even wrote um, parts of recommendations um, that were then used, uh, I guess, to sub uh, apply. Um, if you think about what the process is, the interview, one of the things that they make you do is to do a brief. Um, and so like what Brian was just saying, um, it's not about explaining in depth all the research you have done, but how did you effectively communicate what you've done in a short thing? And in your brief, you have to be able to do that too, be able to research something and in a few sentences communicate what you need to. Um, here, at least you have a few sentences. Sometimes when you're doing presentations, at least in in like investment communities, you have like two slides with three words on each slide. <laughs> so um, it's really about knowing how to get your point across quickly and effectively and so practicing those skills and also having things to point to that you've done that um, show your innovativeness and adaptability perhaps. I think maybe that would be what I would suggest but I'm not one of the interviewers so I would love to hear what they have to say at some point yeah. too. <laughs> Could I ask to add something to that? I think too that um, I agree with uh, both Ampika and, and Brian. The communication piece is important. I think so often as scientists and engineers, we get so used to writing for other scientists and engineers. But in this case, um, the experience you have also in trying to communicate science and engineering to other people who are not those type of individuals is very important. And, I, and so I think that you may find that helpful because even when you're writing an application, um, everybody who's reading it is not the same type of engineer that you are or the same type of scientist that you are. So I think it's important to be able to somehow communicate that in, in a, uh, a very effective way. Uh, and, and one thing I wanted to add, and I think one of you kind of touched on it, but I wanted to bring it out too, in terms of uh, it's important, I know, too, in preparing uh, to, for the future, and right is, is to maybe keep some of those connections that you have and the people that you meet because um, there are often times uh, when, we, when we do we engage in certain activities and then we move on. And I know, especially, I, I, I know I've been guilty of this. And so I think there are a lot of the engineers, especially now I was talking to engineers who, who are like me. Uh, um, we don't always stay as connected as we are to. And so I think that it's, if you can do that, uh, you have a leg up into staying connected with people because then there'll be other people when you do go for those other uh, references, 
on those letters of recommendation from someone, you'll have people to draw from. You're not spending a lot of time wondering, uh, well, who can write something for me? You'd say some great things about me, some of the great things that I've done. And, and sometimes people have a recollection of things that you've done that you won't even remember. And so I think that's very important that we should keep that, keep that connection with some folks along the way. Thanks, I, I love these um, themes that are coming out. Um, follow your passion, um, hone your get to the point communication skills and, um, and the importance of connections. Um, the next question from the audience is, could each of the panelists share a typical project, um, what a typical project is like in their role? <laughs> There's no typical, like at all. Like I've never had a typical day. Um, I think Dr. Vaughn mentioned like, you know, three weeks after she started, right, it's COVID, right? Um, I work in health policy right now. You can imagine our, how our things have changed. Uh, but even, you know, in a non-pandemic world, you know, policy means being able to adapt quickly um, and, and address challenges and needs as they come up. So there's never a typical day, at least my experience, um, Things are constantly changing. Things are constantly evolving. Um, so I think the most typical thing about it is that it's always different. Regina, did you want to go? Well, yeah, well I, I can think. I would say the same thing with Ryan. I, you know, I did all to that as well because um, my day is not really typical uh, where I work, and I think almost anything, any job I've ever had, there's not a typical day. But um, and in this case, as a fellow, there are so many opportunities out there to become immersed in the uh, agency in which you work, and particularly where I am, the division in which I work. Uh, and, and then you can uh, see what other people are doing sometime from day to day. Uh, but at the same time, you can make your own path and do some of the things that you might enjoy doing uh, during uh, your fellowship. So I, I don't think that there is a typical day at all. I do believe that um, there are times like for a project, for me it was to, when I first came in, uh, some of the, there were two other fellows that started in my organization with me and they had to hit the ground running initially because there were some conferences coming up the next month uh, for the people they were working with. But in my case, it was a point of exploration. The guy who I'm working with was new, I was new, and so it's so like, okay, what do, I, what do I do here? So I just started, you know, reading, which you typically do, go in and you read and you start looking at data and saying, hmm, I think I might see a need here. And that's what I did. And I had got a chance to um, participate in some of the other conferences and do some professional development along the way. But at the same time, I, at the same time, I was thinking about how do I, um, what else can I do? Again, thinking about, is there any way to make an impact here in, in one year? Uh, and so, and that's what I, exactly what I did. I just stayed there. I kind of looked around for work to do, and I found myself a project where I think that there was a need for, you know, in this case, uh, maybe more, um, more of the in, in engineering, the director where I am, we to do more with the um, in terms of minority serving institutions, and that was something that everybody else agreed with within the division. Um, okay, so I think that there are offices that you could apply to that or choose to take a position with where they're a little bit less generalist than something like what maybe the three of us are doing um, that might have a little bit more of a specialty, even though it might be broader than what you're coming from. Um, in my case, it's uh, it, this is a very broad, like this is taking a huge step back and very bird's eye in terms of, uh, so there isn't really anything typical and plus you're talking about crisis management so I, I did say that three weeks in COVID cases started popping up but also two and a half weeks in um, we our embassy in Baghdad was attacked and then the whole Iraq Iran situation happened and it was a potential for World War III and Suleimani was hit and all of that happened on my first day being in charge of a part of the world and the part of the world I was in charge of was the Middle East so I was like, uh, what am I supposed to do here? Um, and so you learn very quickly how processes are in place. We put up a task force um, and we're managing, we're having all these calls with um, different head agencies. And uh, it was a very, I can't say that there was anything typical about that. And then basically two weeks later, we had to, the whole Wuhan situation started happening and the quarantine there shocked everyone and how do we handle people, American citizens who are there? How do we handle our own embassies and consulates? And 
then here I was trying to pr provide perspective on what the disease might actually be and how it might um, spread, which we were just getting information early on and how are you interpreting the science of it? So there is a typicalness in the sense that every morning starts off with monitoring what's happening around the world. So there is literally hundreds and thousands of emails that we are like having to scan real quickly to understand what might be a potential hot topic um, that could turn into a crisis. And then after that, the rest of the day is random. It's dealing with whatever is at hand. And what started off with just a few cases then turned to Wuhan being quarantined and then a travel ban for an entire country like China, which we've never done before. And then it just going from there to what the pandemic is now. And we've had this massive global repatriation effort where we've brought back more than 100,000 people that's never been done before either. And so how to do that and how to deal with individuals, it's literally like you're dealing with the problem at hand and um, there isn't anything typical in that perspective, but there are certain processes that start to become typical when you are managing them. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so this question um, comes in two parts. The first part is for all of you, and, and then I'll be directing um, a subset, a second part to Brian. The question for all of you, how did you choose your branch? And then for Brian, um, who, who is doing a third year right now, um, question for Brian, how is working in the legislative branch different from working in the executive branch? We'll start with Regina. Okay, I'll, I'll go for it. I think in choosing a branch, you, it, it, in, in the end, it comes down to a match of, you know, who, when you uh, have a go through a series of interviews, um, where do you fit, basically, and who kind of likes you and who do you like? And so I knew that coming in, based on the things I've done in my past as an engineer, uh, I've worked in the industry, done a lot of work in the community, that I've felt that there were some things about National Science Foundation that I hoped that I would be able to find out more about. And so I, I was fortunate enough where I had some interviews with some, other, um, with some other agencies. I had probably more with National Science Foundation because I think that was kind of more of a natural fit. And I was fortunate enough to end up landing there. And so that's kind of how it goes. And it's, um, some people, have you know maybe more of an insider track, but I came in mostly as an outsider, not knowing uh, really any other fellows except for some who I'd met maybe about seven, eight years ago, who were long gone into other things now. Um, so I didn't really have a, a have a lot of people I could talk to about where to go. And I think, but for me, it, it worked out because some of the people who saw my resume uh, saw the, some of the things that I've done, and my interests, and also doing the interviewing process, I was able to express some of those things. And then I found more of a fit for where I should be. Brian? Uh, yeah, these are great questions. Um, I mean, so the fellowship application, right, is, is branch specific. At least it was when I applied. You applied to congressional or executive. So um, I actually, when I first applied, I applied to both congressional and executive. I ended up as an alternate for the congressional. Um, and then uh, I found a, a really great placement in the executive branch of the National Science Foundation in the Office of Emerging Frontiers in the Director for Engineering. Um, that was that was great. Uh, so I think for me choosing though was essentially, are there issues that I want to work on? Um, and as Dr. Blum said earlier, like you don't necessarily know what office you're going to end up placing into. So you have to kind of think broadly about where you might want to end up. Um, and then also being open to the opportunities, right? Like, you know, I can't say that like the office that I initially inter that I initially placed with was like the top of my list when I first met with them. And then when we did follow-ups, it was like, oh wait, this is a really cool office that's doing really interesting and important things that I think I could be a good fit in. Um, and so it was a good it was a good uh, learning experience for both of, both of us to kind of figure that out. Um, a big difference. So I think one of the things I'll start with is the commonality between the executive and legislative branch is that everybody is the smartest person in the room, right? At the National Science Foundation, everybody is the smartest scientist and engineer out there. Um, and the legislative branch is the same, except it's a much more diverse crowd, right? Everyone's the smartest person in the room, but it's lawyers and doctors and economists and, you know, just the whole group. Um, so I think that's the big 
the, the commonality, but a big difference is in the pace. Um, and I can't speak for how it might be in crisis management, but at the National Science Foundation, <laughs> 18 is a lot slower, at least. I wouldn't say it's slow, but it's much slower than the legislative branch. The legislative branch, I mean, you, <laughs> the timeline can be very rapid. You know, you might have 15 minutes to develop something from scratch and have something ready to go. Um, you know, a, a one day time, time frame is very common. Um, having a week or two to work on something is, is such a luxury. And it's like, wow, there's time to think about this. Um, so I would say that the time frames are incredibly compressed on the congressional side. Um, so to be kind of upfront about this, I am a little, I'm, I'm not coming out of my PhD when I applied for this. I was, it had been some years out and I was looking at a number of different positions and AAAS um, was one of the options of things to do. But the way I felt about the AAAS fellowship was that if I'm going to do it, I want it to be in some adding a kind of skill set and an opportunity that there'd be no way that I would be able to just directly go to that. There's no way I would have gone into a crisis management kind of an office given what my background was. It's not like the opportunities that related to my scientific and my more, all my professional skills before this, I could have found jobs at the NIH and NIST and some other places probably outside of the AAAS fellowship. And one of the things I was thinking about when I was applying to a lot of things was also compensation. And so um, if I'm going to go down the path of doing the AAAS fellowship, it really needed to be a fellowship where I'm gaining a skill set that I didn't or a perspective that I didn't have before. And so I, when I applied and I did all the interviews, the majority of them related to nanotech in some way or commercialization kinds of things because that was what related to my background. The only one office that I, and it wasn't on my original interview schedule, I reached out to them was this one, crisis management, because I read the job description and I was like, you know what? I just kind of want to meet these people because it sounds cool whether or not I actually go into this office, I don't know. I went for the interview and I was just like enthralled. I'm a huge fan of the TV show, Madam Secretary, and it totally affected my decision making at the time. And I ranked crisis management highest being like, if I'm gonna do the AAAS fellowship, it's gonna be the one job that I'm considering that is just completely different than everything else. And in the end, so I did match with CMS and, um, and uh, also I like the idea of getting a better understanding of how foreign policy works. Um, and so it just, it's an interest of mine. And so in the end, when it came down to actually choosing a job outside opportunities or AAAS, I just felt like this would be an opportunity I don't think I would come across again. And it would be such an interesting perspective. I don't know yet what I'm going to do with it next. Um, but cause it's kind of just, I feel like I just started is what it feels like. I know it, it's been a few months, but it feels like I just started with how much of that has happened. And so, um, that was what my decision making was during the time. Okay. So that's a solid piece of advice is, you know, follow your passion and whether or not it comes from a TV show like Madam Secretary. <laughs> um, okay, another question from the audience. Um, what resources did you utilize when preparing your application? For instance, things like peer review or writing programs or policy courses, things like that, anything. Regina? So writing the application, gee, um, I didn't really pull from peer reviews. I really just pulled from my past and I really wrote my application in a form of my interest. Um, I, again, I've, I've worked in industry for a number of years and doing various things as engineers, especially as a business analyst, a systems analyst, project manager, all those things. So I pulled basically from my past experiences in one and then also what I think my interests really are and kind of in a direction where I wanted to go. So I, I, did, I had to draw up on that. I didn't really look at a lot on, you know, well, I, of course, naturally write the application, do write some things, look up a few things on policy, but just to kind of make sure you have a good feel for, um, you know, a sense of what policy is in a, in a way uh, because that comes in handy in the second step you make it if you make it past the first step and to being able to write that other um essay but um so i think it was more or less showing up on that relying on my past looking at my passion knowing what my interests truly are and then hoping to direct that 
And so that could be picked up when people who um, might want to interview me. Not necessarily uh, not wanting to just rely upon and look at things that I've done in the past because I really wanted to move a little bit from that and move in a slightly different direction. Right. Like the first time I applied to the executive branch, I actually I didn't use any resources beyond what was available on the AAAS website. Uh, and the SCPF website does have a lot of information, um, but I didn't have anyone look at it. I didn't know anyone who was a AAAS fellow um, or who had done it or anything like that. I had met one person several years back who had been one, um, but had run like didn't know how to look them up and all that, and they weren't on LinkedIn and all that. So um, the first go around, I didn't have anything i'm and reading my essays again i'm like wow like like i'm surprised i got an interview but thank you um and then the second go around so like when i decided i wanted to do the legislative branch you know i had this huge network built already right so the sdpf network is deep and very talkative um and people want to help um so like not only did i have lots of people to talk to who had done it before but i also had made friends right and my good friend dr emma Wynn, um who she did both both branch uh both branches as well legislative and executive um, was an incredible mentor to me and you know a, a, an incredible friend and mentor um, and i'm so blessed to have had her but she was able to kind of go through my my essays and be like okay like if you're trying to do health like you need to really hit these points and talk about this um and you know dramatically improve my my applications and help me prepare for the interviews on the congressional side and all that so um definitely utilize the network the second time around and it made it a lot easier right um there's a lot more upfront work but it was just a lot more uh, I had a lot more knowledge about what was coming my way, which was really helpful. Um, when I applied, I think the, the, probably the most helpful thing I did was talk to other AAAS fellows in my office that I was working at the time at, at Berkeley Labs. Um, there were six other AAAS fellows in all the leadership offices of, of Berkeley National Labs. It's like packed with AAAS fellows former um and so uh i had been working with them day in and day out for the past year anyways and then when i when they like encouraged me to apply for it i was like okay well tell me how to do it <laughs> and um uh, i got their input on on what i wrote and that's probably the most helpful thing i did beyond that it was kind it was reading the website like what brian said as well okay um the next question is, how was the quality of mentoring and STPS professional development workshops been during your fellowship? I can, I can start, so. Okay. Oh, go ahead, please start it please. <laughs> um, I started later than most people because at Department of State, you have to get your security clearance um, complete before you can actually start your job. So it is, this kind of uncertainty of when you're going to start and if you have family and others that you're moving with you, there is a little bit of um, apprehension and anxiety before because you don't know when your clearance will come through and if it doesn't come through, you can't start and you can't do the fellowship. So it's hard to plan around. Anyways, I got my security clearance and then by the time I started, it was in December. Um, most people start in September. So I missed a couple of the things that happened earlier. I have attended um, one thing. Um, it was an all-day conference about, I don't know, remember the title of it, but it was like career, where you, where you might want to take your career. And there were panelists on from academia, from um, industry, and from government. And um, I found it helpful um, to hear how people, what they've done with their careers, what they found. Some of the panelists have been, are on the hiring front of things too. And so they can give you a lot of tips on how do you actually successfully plan what your application could be for things how do you make sure you're building up the things you need in government positions when you're how the government applications work are very different than how industry and academic um uh, applications work they had folks to come in to talk about resumes and um some other skills that you need and so if you're less familiar with some of those things it's probably really helpful um to have a professional come and talk to you about it also interviewing skills and whatnot and so i found that that was a very useful day to have a, and to also take time off to do something like that is not something I would have done before. And so to have this fellowship where you just sit and you do you take time to do things like this is, um, it's nice. Um, beyond that additional professional things, I'm looking forward to getting involved in more on career development um, and networking when we can. 
after <laughs> lockdowns and social distancing reduce. Any other uh, comments gonna, on I, that? Yeah. I'll, I'll echo that. Um, and I think one of the things that you know we heard earlier is that the AAAS the SCPS like network is deep. So when I went to NSF, my, I had two mentors. Um, one of the mentors was a former fellow, um, and so she knew the system really well. She was like, "Oh, that negotiation training, you should go to that. That's really good." Um, but also, she was very open to like part of it was the office I was in is emerging frontiers. We're looking for the next big thing in engineering, so she's very open to if you can make a case to this conference, I'm totally fine off on it um, as long as you have the, the professional development funds to make it happen. And luckily, you do get professional development funds. Like one of the things I went to was a conference where every attendee was an artist or a medical doctor, and they were talking about how to visualize, you know, they're trying to look at visualization issues, right? Like, so brain surgeons are like, here's what we, what we see when we're doing brain surgery. What can you artists do to help us? And the artists were like, oh my gosh, we have a solution for that, right? Um, so it was this really cool conference. Um, so the mentoring there was really good. The other mentor I had was an NSF lifer. And so she knew all the systems in NSF, which um, if you've never worked at NSF, uh, it's an incredibly steep learning curve. Like the systems there are very ubiquitous to um, NSF, or it's not ubiquitous, they're very idiosyncratic to NSF. Um, so I had a person there who was willing to show me the ropes and help me navigate those systems. Uh, and then on the legislative side, you know, my, my mentor now is actually, you know, she's 25, but she's the smartest person in every room um, and knows everybody. And so she's one of those people who's like, okay, I'm gonna make sure you get to know this person and here's what you need to know about this issue. Um, so she's been really great, but the entire office has been so supportive in terms of, hey, we know you're only here for a short time. Here's what we can do to help you like maximize your chances of staying on the hill if that's what you want to do. Here's what we can do to help you grow in this way if that's if you want to pursue this career opportunity. Um, so there's been a great mixture. Like AAA has had the you know, development workshops, which have been pretty good um, and really helpful in a lot in lots of ways. Like the negotiation workshop was had to, a great benefit, but also having fellows and people who've been through um, the program before was really helpful as well. Okay. Yeah, and I'd just like to say too, for me, I think the professional development has been an area where I've been all years. Um, there's different um, people who come and speak or different, um, like we have the Career Summit, as I'm because I uh, spoke of, and then there has been some others that I think have been very helpful to me and just starting to think. And I remember sitting in one, and I can't remember the exact name of it, but I just, I always carry a little book with me, a little journal, and I just start writing down ideas that I have for some future work that I want to do. And so I think there's so much that, that can be gained by participating. And I know and people make a, a choice whether or not they want to participate or not, but I found that most have been very helpful in some sort of way. There's always something to glean from it. I want to okay. jump in and okay. add something as well. So I was talking about the AAAS professional development things, but within every institute there are other opportunities brian was mentioning what his own mentors have done if you go to department of state um, there is a the foreign service institute which is essentially a university for diplomats all the classes offered there are things you can tap do if you want to as long as you get support from your your office to take time off to go do that or not take time off but to be away from the office to do that and my office has been pretty supportive. I've done, I think, three classes thus far, and there's some that I'm looking forward to. Negotiations is one of them, but there's also something called facts training, which is basically how do you handle yourself if you're being shot at or whatever, and you have like these, like you run around and you like play these scenarios out. Like there's fun stuff, and then there's things that you could focus on. It could be a, a language or something that you wanted to. So that's an interesting way of developing some other skills if you'd like um, at Department of State. Yeah, and I, was, I would add to that even in National Science Foundation, any course basically open to most of the people that work there are also open to us as fellows. So we have, we get a chance to go through that catalog as well to figure out what we want to do. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, the, um, okay, here's a question. Was this fellowship your first experience in science policy? Um, and what was the most challenging part of transitioning to the policy world? This was definitely my first uh, experience really in science policy. It's something that I've always wanted to do. Uh, and, and, and even at National Science Foundation, when you say policy, it's a little bit tricky because I think um, it's not what you consider a direct policy. And Brian can also speak to this perhaps um, because he worked there before us, but it's not direct 
policy that, that we're generating on a daily basis. Um, but there are ways that I think that the tasks that you do can affect policies, even uh, for the foundation for the future. Uh, for instance, I'll just even take some things like if you look at something like outreach, you know, where does that outreach, if you say, I think we should do more outreach, then that's a way that now it's not maybe not a written policy that they'll have, but maybe that's something that will be followed for maybe not this year, but for some years to come, as long as some of the people are still there in place, and maybe it will be something that becomes a standard, but it's not something that was there. But I, yeah, this was my first opportunity to do that, and it's something that I've always wanted to do, and I think it's been a joy to be able to, it's, it's this fellowship that has enabled that to happen. Um, for me, this was not my first um, experience with science policy, uh, starting whenever I was at the NIH during grad, well, a little bit after grad school when I was doing um, postdoc and stuff, I started getting involved in the National Nanotech Initiative, which is all related to nanotech policy. Um, so I was attending a lot of those events and putting together documents related to it. Um, when I went into industry and with um, Bikanta, we were, or sorry, the company that I was running, uh, we used to contribute a lot to conversations on how um, science is commercialized, and so would attend a lot of science, and and also actually do a lot of um, tours, I guess, or like conversations with um, congressmen about it. So it was a different kind of approach to. I'd say saying that involvement in policy, I feel like, is a very broad thing. Just like saying, have you your first experience with science? How you're, what you're doing within that big bubble of of policy is a very different aspect of it. And I think previous to, and then when I was at at Lawrence Berkeley, that was definitely all about science policy. Where my project was about um, building um, some facilities and a new campus um, related to nanotech and energy sciences. And so what agencies would have to work together on that and what kind of science would happen there. It was definitely very much about science policy, but each of those experiences versus this experience are very different in terms of what is policy. So I feel like previously, at least the earlier parts of my career, it was very much about an individual, a scientist trying to make small contributions to conversations. Um, and then it became, and that would be, and I used to write things for like TechCrunch and other things about science policy as well. And so it was very much like my individual perspective on stuff. Then when I went to Lawrence Berkeley and coming here, it's 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 so you can have an impact with your voice for sure. But what I've what I'm trying to understand better is is how do you have impact when you're coordinating multiple people and as a group effort. And so that I started going into that a bit with Lawrence Berkeley, but here has definitely been that. This has been very much a perspective, and I don't. It's been a perspective of how are we coordinating the entire Department of State, but also with other agencies and other governments, and so that. It's less about an individual perspective and much more about coordination efforts. And so for me, that's been my journey through science policy or general health policy is um, those different approaches towards it. And I'll add like, I mean, so I think both both my colleagues have made an incredibly great point. Um, the only thing I have to add to that is like, I didn't have any experience with science policy, but it's also important to remember if you're applying that having an, a background in science policy or in government is not a prerequisite for this position, right? Um, the fellowship is a, is a learning and professional development thing as much as it is uh, in any other type of role. Um, so the chance to learn and grow, and I think you've heard all three of us talk about like we took things in different directions, right? We were looking for a bit of a career change or like to shift like our focus a bit. And this is a really great place to do that, right? Like you have a chance to, to bring your expertise, but also to be enveloped in an environment that um, will challenge you and, and allow you to think differently about something. Um, the biggest challenge for me, I think, uh, me, hmm, I mean, there's there's a lot to learn, right, about how government works. So, so that's always like the, the fun part. I wouldn't say that's necessarily a challenge, but it is something to keep in mind. Um, I think the biggest challenge I've heard from just talking to lots of people is a lot of, of scientists tend to be very independent. You know, and before this, I was director of a center and all that. So you know, I made the decision, like this is what we're going to do. Um, and then coming into a fellowship where you're definitely not the director. Um, you're like, oh, right, like you're not making those choices. Like everything goes through multiple layers of clearance and there's lots and lots of conversation about stuff. Like the government moves slowly in large part for, for a reason um, with certain exceptions, right? Um, things get vetted repeatedly. Um, and so uh, you know, learning how to navigate that and go through the different chains of command um, are 
because it was, it was a learning process. Thank you. Um, everyone, we've sadly come up on our hour, but I've got just one parting question to the three of you. What advice do you have for someone about to embark on an STPF journey? Well, I'll go first, I guess. Uh, my advice would be to um, take the plunge. Uh, do it. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's going to be well, you'll find it's well worth your while. Um, I meet formal, uh, former fellows just about everywhere I go. I find myself sitting at a table, so oh, I was a triple A fellow, really, and they'll tell me about some of the experience they're having, and, and, and they're doing um, any number of type of, uh, in any number of type of positions. Uh, they're out there in the government, nonprofit, for profit, uh, some of the entrepreneurs. And I think if you have any of those, uh, any aspiration to go in a particular direction, this might be a good way to go. Um, you know, um, uh, I think along the way you have to be a bit patient, though, in terms of the, the process, in terms of becoming a fellow. Uh, something that takes uh, a few months. <laughs> Once you write that application and submit it November 1st, uh, you won't hear anything back for a little while. But uh, and even after that point, there, there'll be a few months when you're in the midst of, uh, it's like it goes on for quite some time. It, things aren't really clear until well, maybe around the first of maybe April, May. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it, is, it is time consuming, so you should be patient. Uh, it can be a little bit exhausting. It's not for necessarily the faint of heart. And I don't think anybody who applies for this is, uh, is, would be in that category anyway. You're not going to be faint of heart. You're going to be up for the challenge. Um, and so I think just to make sure, you know, don't delay really, I would say, starting on the application. Even if you, as I think her cat said, it would start opening the first, it would, the application would open in June, uh, June 1. Uh, even if you don't start June 1, uh, start as soon as you can because, and then find those people who can be those, uh, write those letters of recommendation for you because they're going to be busy. Uh, you're going to have to call upon them and remind them that they need to do it as well. And you're going to need time to go over that, over the application and, uh, and go through this process yourself uh, multiple times, read it, reread it, have somebody else read it, proof it, and then uh, eventually submit it. So, and you'll be likely you're a busy person. So you'll need the time and you don't want to rush it. Uh, and I would also like to encourage people who may be, you know, some lot of people come right out of, uh, out of uh, a PhD program or a postdoc. Uh, there are other of us who have worked for quite some time and come in mid to late career. I would definitely encourage those folks to, to apply as well. Uh, as an engineer and scientist, your, your skills are still uh, appreciated. Uh, no matter where you are in your career, and I think that you, you'll find that you can enjoy this uh, this fellowship experience. Those are those are great points. I I, I think I'll just build on that. Um, we need all hands on deck, right? Like I mean, we're we're facing big problems right now, um, and they require everybody. Um, and I think what I've heard from other people, you know, especially like the social scientists out there, please apply because your expertise matters right now. Uh, my friend Emerald is a sociologist, and she has this great poster of her at a protest saying, do protests work? Ask a sociologist, right? Um, but even like the, with the current pandemic, right? Like one example, like you know, with mask wearing, right? That's a, that's a scientific and a behavioral question, right? Like do masks work, right, in, in various ways? And that like, there's the science behind that, right? But there's also like, well, if we're gonna ask people to wear masks, how, what's the best way to do that? How do we keep that going in the long term? And those are behavioral questions where we need you know, everybody's expertise to, to bring to bear on this. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Pope Ford, as you mentioned, you know, we need, uh, like, this, the fellowship works across the entire career track, right? I think all of us had had different experiences before we came to the fellowship, but everyone from someone fresh out of, you know, their PhD through, you know, a, someone who's had a much a longer career is welcome and, and brings useful and valuable skills um, and will learn useful and valuable skills while they're here. Um, I want to like super, super uh, emphasize what Dr. Gray just said. Um, there's a need there and you can have impact. Um, what people are make decisions off of is what they're exposed to. And so the more, um, I don't know, scientific backgrounds they can be exposed to as they're making decisions about stuff, the only better, the better it is. In terms of advice, um, I think maybe some of you can relate um, as scientists or medics or vets, um, 
your life usually had a little bit of a plan, like I'm going to be in med school for this long and then residency or whatever, or if you're a PhD, you're going to do postdocs and whatever. You always had kind of a plan of how things are going to go and you're used to wanting to have a plan. Um, I think if you're going into this fellowship, your plan needs to be that I will make a plan after it starts and af <laughs> as the weeks go by um, and not that uh, you have to find some some ability to uh, just adjust to what is happening. Um, you might go into an office thinking you're going to work on a particular project, but things have evolved and that won't be the project you start on. Um, and if you're in a legislative position, your project will maybe change every 15 minutes, like Dr. Gray just said. Um, and so uh, you just kind of have to be able to accept that, um, find find it within yourself to be okay with, with uh, not having a very specific plan when you're coming in with this. Great, thank you. Um, pivot quickly, take the plunge, um, and we need all hands on deck. I love it. Uh, the application opens June 1st again. Visit our website to read more about the program. We'll also post a recording of this chat and the other ones as they occur. The next one is on June 17th, um, insider tips on the application and interview process. If we couldn't get to your question today, please email us at fellowships at AAAS.org. We hope to see you here again. Enjoy the rest of your day.